Good morning, Gateway Bible. Wasn't it a great day yesterday to give us a sense of awareness of our missionaries and what they are doing and, and who they are? Um, we're ready for round two. And I love these songs that give, give us the message, the whole message. Why missions? Why do we do what we do? Uh, why is it important for us to go into all the world and preach the gospel, make disciples? Stand with us as we sing.
can be seated. And a warm welcome to everyone that's here today. And as you can see, a little bit different arrangement. But what we began yesterday was to travel around the world in two days, if you can imagine that, and tap into the work of God's gospel as it penetrates going near and far to reach people from all tongues and tribes and nation. And we want to continue uh, that celebration this morning. And so we welcome not only those of our church body, but we've got friends and uh, folks that have come in and as well as those who are online. And our prayer this morning is that as we exalt the Lord and worship him for who he truly is, for who he truly is, we're reminded of, of his heart to take us, to use us, to carry his gospel far and wide. And even as we said yesterday morning, to give us a perspective, a hope, an encouragement, a challenge in that regard. The psalmist writes, Psalm 67, verse 1, May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on the earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples, plural, praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For the judge that judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O Lord. Let all the peoples praise you. And so that's why we have come here to praise the Lord. But we're reminded that as worshipers, we're to be witnesses of God's glorious gospel. So we invite you to share in that. And as we have missionaries who come and, and share this morning, and we have a, the privilege of hearing from Tim as he preaches and challenges us, us towards the, the Great Commission. Then we look forward to a time, a luncheon, a food and fellowship after our gathering this morning. So I'm going to pray and then uh, the joy of hearing from Chris and Beth Matthews as they come and share. Join with me. Father, we look to you all this morning so grateful for your presence here. We're reminded even as it says in Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 17 that you delight in and over your people and over the privilege that we have this morning to worship you in spirit and in truth. To be reminded of your saving power that has come and reached into each of our hearts. But rather than for it to remain just with us, we're called to join you in this great endeavor in advancing your kingdom. And carrying your gospel far and wide to see others from every tongue and tribe and nation. Lord, we give thanks this morning for those who to whom you have enabled us to collaborate with the missionaries that, that uh, have shared and will share this morning and even as Chris comes momentarily. And Lord, that, that as we listen and we hear of the saving power of your gospel as it reaches into all of continents and is penetrating into various nations, Lord, would our hearts be open to you? Would it be that you would even stir and call folks here to join with you, even in ex ex uh, ex particular ways, particular ways of, of joining and being a part of advancing your gospel. We look to you, O oh Lord. We thank you for your presence here. And we do pray for and over our missionaries for your encouragement, strengthening, fortifying of their hearts and lives. And thank you for the privilege that we have to share in that with them as well. So we commit this morning and all that will unfold to you and give thanks for what you will accomplish for your name's sake. In Jesus' name we pray. Well, as I said, uh, it's a joy this morning as we, first of all, welcome Chris and perhaps Beth as well. I still remember a wonderful trip that Todd and I took about 16 years ago to travel over to Spain to team up with them. And just to see them in that context and get a taste of their heart and to see their love for the Spanish-speaking people, and even now as, as the Lord has expanded their platform to carry that far and wide. So, Chris, if you would come and share with us uh, this morning. We love you guys, and we're grateful for you. Thank you. God bless you. Well, we're people like you, uh, members of a local church, called out in 1998 to go to Spain from Hickory, community chapel and then uh, 2008 called from Spain to go to Spanish-speaking lands and 2018 to go even further beyond those lands to 
nearby areas in Central and South America, and then today in all parts of the world. So uh, further travels for the kingdom. So if we'll go to the next slide, please. So recently we just went over to Spain, to Sevilla, Spain, in, in September, just last month, and spent a week there. It was a fast and furious week. But uh, we were visiting and encouraging the seminary staff, and um, it had been many, many months of shutdown for them and trouble and difficulties. Uh, but Spain's starting to open back up again, and because we have Spanish residency visas still, and yet we have a permanent visas to live in Spain for the rest of our lives, um, we're able to get in and out of Spain without too much difficulty. Next slide. So Beth taught a class on biblical counseling. She didn't want to say anything about it, but I think it was a good class from what I could tell. She um, taught two or three folks that were face-to-face -face with her there in the, in the classroom. And at the same time, on the other side of the screen, you see down at the bottom on the right, through her computer screen, she was teaching about nine or ten more scattered across the world. And so all in Spanish, all about biblical counseling and teaching them how to uh, understand their own selves, how to deal with conflicts, and how to uh, rightly relate to the Word of God and see His grace in their lives. Next slide. One of the joys of, of being in Spain is we're able to visit people in their homes. And so we have a new campus down in Malaga, Spain, about two and a half hours from Seville. This is all in southern Spain. And this is one of our teachers, Jesus Gonzalez, the one with the beard, not, the, uh, not us. But there's, his wife's on the other side. She didn't show up in the picture for some reason. But um, Jesus is a dear man of God, and his wife, Maria, are very faithful to serve the Malaga students and challenging them to grow in their faith and encouragement. All glory to Jesus. Next slide. So another thing is one of our graduates, and we have lots of graduates. As I mentioned yesterday, glory to God, over 800 people have come through our program over these past 20-something years. And so we try to keep up with the graduates. One of them moved to Lincolnton, North Carolina. Have you ever been to Lincolnton? Just down the road. And that's this guy in the picture. I mean, can you imagine? He's from Venezuela originally. But he's finished up at the seminary, and now he's taking a master's degree program, and he does uh, capsules of theology, he calls it, on, online uh, through the Internet. And God is using him to bless and encourage many South Americans and Central Americans through the Internet. Next slide. And so some of you will ask, what about that old monastery project? Well, we've been chasing that thing for 22 years now. <laughs> it's a long time. And you kind of wonder, is it ever going to happen? We wonder the same thing. The, the people in charge are still very um, strongly adamant about controlling the facility, but they have yielded to finally fixing up the exterior wall and some of the most dangerous parts that are about to fall over on the inside. So uh, we've learned in missions, and many of the missionaries here will tell you the same thing, you can't do it alone. You need partners. And so we're starting to partner more and more with missionaries from other countries. And so this man... Daniel Sukala, that you see there on the, on the right, uh, is the leader of Liebenzell, that's the name of our agency, Liebenzell, Germany, for the field of Spain. So he came all the way, eight hours away on a train, and visited the monastery with me and got really enthused, and then went out to eat with our academic dean and got more enthused, and now he's ordering books about the history of the Spanish Reformation and what happened with the heroes of the 16th century. And so he's going to go back and tell all the leaders in Germany about it. And so I'm supposed to go to Germany and stay three, three weeks in January and begin to forge strong partnerships for a whole network of churches to get behind this great project. So maybe God was just waiting for more puzzle pieces to fit into the map. So we're trying to be patient and, and do things his way. Um, you know, it took Moses 40 years to get ready for the Exodus experience. And uh, it took, uh, you know, uh, Brother Noah 120 years to build the ark. So maybe with 22 years, we're just getting started. <laughs> Next slide, please. Now, one of the joys of being the leader of Liebenzell USA is now I'm going to other countries I've never been before. Recently, I was down in Ecuador. I plan to be in the other side of the world in Micronesia in February. And then we'll be in Zambia probably in March or April. But these are, are lovely people that came from Japan, from the Liebenzell office in Japan, to minister to Japanese people that live in up, you know, up north of New York City. 
there's thousands of Japanese that live in that area. Many of them are Japanese Americans. Some of them are Japanese people who live there and do business and go back to Japan. Well, this is Masahiro and uh, his wife that ministered there in uh, White Plains, New York. So we got to go by and attend the Japanese service. I sat there for an hour and 15 minutes and understood nothing. <laughs> but I caught on to a few phrases. And then afterwards, we went out to, of course, a Japanese restaurant and had a, just a delightful time with this sweet couple and their leadership staff. Next slide. So as we're on the topic of the foreign land of Northeast United States, which is a, a territory you almost have to take a passport to get in, it's spiritually dark. There's a lot of difficulties there. There's a lot of needs. There's a, a bunch of uh, unsaved folks that are atheistic or agnostic. And so our mission this coming weekend celebrates 80 years of existence in that section. Uh, it was founded in October of 1941 because there were German missionaries that had gotten caught between the problems that were breaking out in China where they were missionaries and they couldn't get back there and then their own country was fighting against the different parts of Europe. So they were in America raising funds and they got kind of stuck and they could have been put into internment camps, which was the U.S. way of talking about concentration camps here during World War II. We actually had them here in our country. And so local German folks had compassion on them, and uh, they actually went and bought a piece of property with 150 acres for $50 down payment and then paid off the rest later with help from churches from New York and Philadelphia and established a beachhead there in, on Schoolies Mountain in New Jersey. And just six weeks after they established it, Pearl Harbor broke out, and the Japanese attacked the U.S., and suddenly the U.S. was sucked into the World War II situation. And so then you really needed a place for refugees, missionaries that were trying to do God's work. They weren't spies. They weren't terrible people, but they had to have a place to go. And so the gospel is proclaimed there on the campus. It has 22 buildings at capacity for almost 300 guests. And so we have churches come in that hear the gospel, and we have martial art groups that come in. We have Bible studies that come in. We have ladies quilting classes and activities and handicrafts. All sorts of types of groups and collectives come there that are, you know, even in name Christian, but some of them might not be saved. They hear the clear gospel, and people are getting saved and rededicating their life to Christ right on the campus of Schoolies Mountain. So this weekend, we will have an amazing 80th anniversary celebration the guest speaker is Bruce Marciano, who was a Hollywood actor that came to faith in Christ when he was in his 30s and then was selected to uh, be the one who portrayed Christ in the gospel according to Matthew and later in the television movies, The Encounter and uh, those kind of TV series. Uh, really dear, humble man who agreed to be our keynote speaker. But exciting is David and Karen Keyes' daughter-in-law is going to come and sing at this very event with Williamson Branch. Isn't that great? And so we're going to have local flavor with bluegrass and country-style music right there in New Jersey. Now, what will the New Jersey people think of that? <laughs> well, a lot of them are farmers. New Jersey is actually the garden state. There's a lot of rural areas there that do like country music and, and bluegrass. And so we've gone around and spread 500 flyers all over the towns and villages in the area inviting people from uh, laundromats and, you know, liquor stores and vape shops and all sorts of places. Come, come, hear this music. Come, come and hear this message. So pray for that, that uh, we might have as many as 500 guests. Pray for Friday night that there would be a great outpouring of the gospel in word and song. Saturday night as well, word and song. And then Sunday morning there will be a great outpouring in word. So... Yeah, pray there wouldn't be any rain, because it's supposed to rain all day Saturday. We've got hay rides, we've got bonfires, we've got scavenger hunts, which we might have to do under tents. Can you imagine putting a bonfire on the back of a hay ride and scavenging around under a tent? It'd be kind of tricky, but pray would be great weather, that it wouldn't, wouldn't be bad, so that we could have a wonderful time and praise the Lord and people will be saved. So thank you for praying for humility, strength, wisdom, provision. This is like an eye test. I can't really see it. Where the, yeah, kindness and joy, okay? Now, I'd like to invite Steve Hutchison if he'd come up and pray for us along those lines. Sometimes it's hard to keep up with Chris and Beth there uh, 
either in Mexico or South America or Cuba or uh, wherever they go, but they, they uh, um, have that Spanish-speaking ministry all over Europe. Uh, we went out to little Guatemala the other day, and, and uh, uh, Chris was having a great time talking with Christian, and they were just uh, uh, chatting away. I don't know about what, but anyway, uh, I know that uh, Chris and Beth both have s such a strong heart for the Lord, strong heart for missions, and so uh, uh, let's pray. And as they reminded you to pray for this 80th anniversary for Liebenzell this weekend. Um, so uh, anything else you want to add, Beth? Yeah, yeah. Amen. It's, uh, it is the Lord's work. And uh, just seeing uh, God uses Beth in her counseling ministry here. I was just talking to her how she has to go in and out of Spanish speaking and English speaking in her counseling, so uh, they've got a lot. Father, we're grateful for uh, the ministry that Chris and Beth have, grateful for Liebenzell and uh, the sending ministry they have, and we just pray, first of all, for this weekend coming up, that you would uh, bless this conference with good uh, weather. We pray that you would... Uh, uh, be with each of the speakers, Lord, uh, that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit and that you would continue to bless the ministry that Chris and Beth have with uh, Spanish-speaking people wherever they go. So we just uh, ask you to guide them and enable them and continue to give them strength um, as they continue to do this for, the, for many, many years. So... Uh, we just give you all praise and glory and thanks for their ministry. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our songs this morning uh, were uh, somewhat in, inspired uh, for us to do here this morning, not necessarily to be written uh, by the panel of missionaries we had yesterday who shared the uh, their their vision for their their um, perspective fields, but but also some hard questions. You know, what are some of the toughest things that you've had to uh, deal with, and um, uh, what about your call? How did that start? And and what about your day to day taking care of kids and and meeting the needs of of day to day life? And so. Um, uh, as I thought about that, I thought about this prayer that was actually prayed uh, hundreds of years ago. Stand with us as we sing.
Okay, our next group <laughs> is a family that most of you are familiar with, the DiMartinos. And we have Ricky and Aiden. A children's Church, please. Um, children are dismissed for Children's Church. We have special activities for them. And they'll just meet in this first room over here. They have special time with a special missionary. Either way, either way. Okay. She don't want to be in the limelight. <laughs> so anyway, Ricky and Aiden, they serve with jars. 
they met in college and they were married 2007. 2007. They have four children and they have currently number five who will arrive in April. So we're going to pray for that. And um, they joined JARS in 2018. Wycliffe. Wycliffe. <laughs> okay. Uh, and so Ricky's going to just share about what they're doing in media services there. Yes, thank you very much for uh, having us, and thank you so much for all your generous partnership in the uh, ministry work that we've been doing. We uh, are so very thankful for it, and it's cliche, but we really could not do it without you guys. And I told uh, uh, Don I have the unique misfortune of going after and following all these great missionaries that we have here at Gateway. And so that's a good problem to have, too many great missionaries. But, uh, yeah, so um, who here likes media? Not the media, but media. So uh, movies, uh, music, the Internet, uh, phones. The question is, who's on their phone right now instead of looking up here? Uh, all right, I think you're all in the clear. But, yeah, media, for better or for worse, is... Uh, where everyone is at nowadays, and especially the younger generation. And uh, more and more so, it's, it's the language people use to communicate. And uh, they, they receive information and they pass on information that way. So if that's where people are, if people are on media, if they're on devices like this all the time, then that's where the body of Christ needs to be, at least in some respect. And so that's what our team at International Media Services uh, the team and I, that's what we uh, try to do, make God's word reach people through media. And uh, speaking of media, we have a little video clip for you to watch here to tell you a little bit more about who we are. If you yeah, click, the, click the image, click the, click the picture. Okay. Um, all right, yeah, one of the things about media is there's media difficulties from time to time. So we will, we'll, we will show you that clip another time perhaps. But uh, that's fine. We can, we can move on from there. That'll give, that'll make, uh, uh, that'll give Tim more time for his sermon. So um, yeah, next slide. Yeah, so uh, the, to, to boil down what you were going to see in the video into one sentence, we work with the local language leaders around the world. They're the real heroes of the story. They're the, uh, if you had to think of it as an analogy, they would be something like an Esther. They're the ones who are on the scene, able to make a difference for their communities. But we can come alongside them sort of like Mordecai. We can offer advice or mentoring or training or resources or tools, but they're ultimately the ones who make an impact for their communities. And we work with them to help uh, produce and distribute media resources that expand scripture possibilities for their communities. And next slide. The, the goal of all of it is we want to see people flourishing. We want to see people living life to the fullest like Jesus came to give. And we know the best way that happens is when people can get God's word in their language so they can really understand it for themselves. And then once that word can saturate a society, that's when true flourishing can really begin to happen in all spheres of life. Not just spiritually, not just interpersonally, but educationally, economically, you name it. And so we're very uh, thankful and grateful to be uh, a small part of that. And you guys, Gateway, are a part of that. And so praise the Lord for that. And so the question is now, what kinds of resources do you help people with exactly? And in a previous time here, I've talked about uh, apps on a smartphone and, and how we have been using those to reach people. But today I want to highlight something different, and that is audio production. And this has been on my mind lately because I just finished a three-week intensive training in audio, an audio production course. And in that course, we, we had to learn how to do, uh, um, among other things, dramatized scripture recording. And as part of that, we had to learn how to build our own makeshift sound booth 
and you can see an example of that in this picture right here. But uh, not just, uh, we didn't just get firsthand experience doing scripture recording, but also other projects that would help make the scriptures come alive for people. So learning how to produce radio spots or participatory radio dramas that incorporate scriptural themes or audio documentaries or learning how to facilitate debates and anything that would be used or the audio could, could uh, help bring to life for people. And you can proceed to the next slide. And this was the, uh, the class. There were three instructors and six students, and we all spanned the globe. I was the only American student, but we had a student from South Sudan right there in the middle, a, a, student, a Korean student serving in Malaysia on the left there. And yeah, your left. And then in the bottom left, we had a student from Uganda and then two students from Ethiopia. And all these students, including myself, have been trained to use audio production to help make the Word of God come alive for our different communities that we serve. And what that means uh, for all of us, and for me in particular, is to, to use this training in one of two ways. And that is, one, to either pass on this knowledge and this skill to build capacity in others at some point down the road, or two, to look to my own sphere of influence to help people get God's word in their language through audio means. And a prime example of that very well could be the Marshallese community here in Morganton in North Carolina. Pastor Tommy of the Marshallese Church here in Morganton, he and I have talked about how the Marshallese have a, an audio New Testament, but they don't have an, an audio Old Testament. And they are an oral culture. They prefer to uh, receive information, scripture, through oral means. They, many of them, even though they can read and write, and they do have a, a print Bible, they still like to hear the spoken word or watch drama unfold and talk about things. And so he and I have talked about getting the Old Testament in audio form for the whole Marshallese language. And so that's something you can pray about. That would be a big undertaking if we set out to do that. We probably could uh, do it in small books at a time, but uh, you can pray about that. Uh, next slide, please. And this, this is an example of the impact we love to see in, in, through audio scripture. This was uh, an example in Peru. Uh, we have um, two people that we regularly hear from. They're native Peruvians. Their names are Eberson and Roxana, and they travel all over the Andes Mountains in Peru to Quechua speaking people. These are people who don't read, don't read and write. Many of them don't speak Spanish. They live in rural villages, and they only speak Quechua. These are descendants of the, the mighty Inca Empire from long ago. And now God's word is reaching these descendants of the, uh, the Inca Empire. And uh, Everson and Roxana, they go around these different villages, and they play God's word in Quechua through little audio devices, little audio players, and they form uh, listening groups. And... Every month we get reports from Everson and Roxana, and it's every month we hear about dozens and dozens of people coming to Christ, it seems. And they're not just leading people to Christ, but they're also discipling future uh, leaders, the future disciple makers. And that's what you see in the picture on the left there is uh, the, the graduates of a recent training workshop where they trained uh, new, new believers, new disciples to use their own, they gave them audio players, audio units, and they trained them how to use those audio players and to go amongst their own communities and form listening groups and to begin disciple, begin discipling new believers. And then the guy there on the right, he just became a believer about two months before the workshop, before that picture was taken. And he is the president of his local community. And he has gone back and has begun playing the scriptures over the town loudspeaker in his uh, village. So you can imagine if uh, one of us did that here in uh, Morganton. But uh, we, we praise God for what is happening among the, uh, the descendants of the, the Inca Empire. And that's just one example of, of what goes on around the world. Last slide. And one other thing I will mention is that, um, I can't show you a picture of it, but 
because of your contributions, because of your partnership and your support, our staff at Inter International Media Services down at JARS was able to buy 1,000, over 1,000 SD cards, little SD cards that you could put into uh, uh, little audio devices. And those, those will be fitted with scripture in a given language, and they will be uh, put in little audio devices. And those will be delivered through various channels to believers in a sensitive country. And I can't tell you any more details than that, but if you're curious, you can come up and ask me afterwards. But uh, uh, believers who def desperately need God's word right now, and uh, we can pray that the enemy does not steal the seed that will be planted among those believers. So... Um, praise God for, for that. Last slide here, and this is um, the, the progress of where Bible translation is at. And two years ago when I was here, back in October of 2019, the, the number there in the middle, which is number of languages that still need a translation project to start, that don't have any scripture and still need a project to start, the number there in the middle was 2,134, give or take. And so now, two years later, in October of 2021, that number has decreased by almost 200. And that's with a, a COVID year in between. And so that isn't bad progress. It's, we still like to see better, but uh, we thank God for those languages that have been able to at least get a translation project underway so they can begin hearing God's word in their own language, in a way they best uh, receive it. And... At that rate, about 200 languages every two years, that means only about 20 years, give or take, before that number hits zero. So we're still making good progress. Obviously, we'd love to see that number accelerate even faster, and, and there's definitely plans to make that happen, and I believe God will make that happen. But uh, Gateway is a key part in helping to fulfill Matthew 24, 14, that the good news will be preached to all generations before Christ comes back. And so, thank you very much for that, and praise God that uh, you've been a part of that. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Ricky. Um, I want to take some time and pray for Ricky and Aiden and their family. And this morning, I asked them specifically some things that we could pray for. And he gave me a scripture, Ephesians three fourteen through 19. So we're just going to pray this over them. Um, so if you'll just join with me. Heavenly Father, um, we do just lift up the DiMartino family. We praise you, Father, for just making a reality their desire to serve you. Um, Father, I know it was a long time coming, and we know that you are using them mightily. Father, and even off the mission field, how they've touched so many lives. Father, we give you thanks for their family. Pray that you would bless this little one that's growing, that you would protect Aiden um, and give her strength, protect their family as they travel um, around the world or across the states. Um, Father, I pray for Ricky for strength. Um, I know that he um, shared that a lot of the workforce at Wycliffe is aging out. So we pray that you would raise up young, fresh minds that you would bring helpers to take some of that burden from him. Father, we pray for just their mechanics of the day. We thank you for helpers that you bring into their home. Uh, pray that you would just continue um, to provide for their needs. Father, I thank you for this special blessing that Aiden and Ricky have been in my own life and just their family and how Aiden is such an inspiration to me. Father, we just... Thank you. I want to pray um, the scripture. Father, my response is to get down on my knees before the Father, this magnificent Father who parcels out all heaven and earth. I ask him to strengthen you by his spirit, not a brute strength, but a glorious inner strength, that Christ will live in you as you open the door and invite him in. And I ask him that with both feet planted firmly on love, you'll be able to take in with all followers of Jesus the extravagant dimensions of Christ's love. Reach out and experience the breath. Test its strength. Plumb the depths. Rise to the heights. Live full lives 
full in the fullness of God. Father, we pray that for all of our missionaries as they go forth. We just pray that you would just continue to uh, provide Christ all around us, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yesterday, the uh, missionaries shared the reality that um, when they leave um, what they would call home to go serve in another area, it, um, uh, they, they struggle with what then becomes home, right? But when Jesus calls us, uh, we actually have another home. It's not here. And we start to realize how uh, how much this life uh, starts to fade as we long for our real home. Well, I started thinking about that, and it, it led me to a song that we often sing around the campfire, if you grew up in America and in, 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 in American churches. Um, and the name of that song for years, it was written over 100 years ago, uh, was A Psalm. All right, y'all don't know you sang that, did you? Do you remember a psalm growing up? No, you don't. Uh, a psalm actually refers to this place in northeastern India. You can see it there. And uh, it was written by um, a convert uh, to Christianity from that area uh, because he knew that to uh, accept Christ and live for him would most likely certainly end up in death. But he decided... Uh, to make that commitment anyway, and he put this to song um, in a psalm. And, it, and it's interesting uh, that just uh, near a psalm, if you go to the next slide, um, is another uh, little country. Go to the next slide, uh, Bangladesh. So uh, it's interesting that this song originated there. So stand with us as we sing. <clears throat>
couples that we'll be partnering with in missions is Tim and Hannah Gregory. Uh, you all know Hannah as uh, the daughter of uh, Rick and Becky Edmondson, and uh, they shared yesterday their ministry, and today uh, Tim is going to share God's word with us. An exciting couple of days, exciting two days, getting to see all the things that God is doing, getting to hear from fellow co-laborers all around the world, and, and getting to see what God will do through all of us, not just the ones who were up here sharing about their ministries. Well, I do not have a lot of time. Uh, it feels like I never have a lot of time when I get to preach, but I'm going to get right to the point. So if you will, open your Bibles to Matthew 28. A familiar passage. Just to remind of context, Jesus had already fulfilled his ministry. He had gone to the cross. He had risen from the dead. His disciples were so confused to see him alive again. And he brings them to the mountain as he's about to ascend. And he gives his final orders to the church, to the church Catholic, the, uh, the universal church through the twelve apostles. So, verse 18, it says, Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. It's beautiful. He, the Gospel of Matthew started with Jesus being proclaimed by the angel as Emmanuel, God with us. And it ends with that same bookend where Jesus says, I am with you always, Emmanuel. Now, I want to ask a question about this command because we've probably, if you've grown up in the church, you've probably read this verse, this passage, many times over. You've probably heard many sermons from uh, a missionary or inspiring missionary about this passage, but I have a question to ask about this. This is something that I heard from David Platt recently, about a year ago, which completely rocked my understanding of what Jesus is commanding in these verses. So I want to ask a question. Is the Great Commission, where Jesus says, go and make disciples of all the nations, is the Great Commission a generalized or a specialized command? Is it general or is it specific? You, you can multiply examples of this, but is he saying that we need to be doing some sort of general work, or does he give them a very specific command that they're to, to, to fill out? We'll see that in due time. 
exactly what the command entails. But first, before we do that, let me just give you some up-to-date status on the ethne that he talked about. He says, go therefore and disciple panta ta ethne, right? All of the nations. Well, let me give you some information about the nations that he's talking about. If we have a picture um, to put up there. If you look at this, this was taken from the Joshua Project. You can go there yourself. I encourage you to go there regularly. Just go to Joshua Project, Google it. It'll take you right to this page. Here we have represented Panta Ta Ethne, all the nations in the earth. Every single dot that you see on the screen, I know it's very hard to see because there's lots of nations. Uh, every single dot that you see represents a people group. They either have their own culture, language, way of life. They, it's a geopolitical entity, an ethnos, or an, all of the ethne. As you look at the screen here, you'll notice that some dots are green, some are yellow, and some are red. Green dots represent those countries which have more than 2% Christian population. So they're green. They're considered reached. They have the gospel. It has permeated the people. The church is existing and thriving, and it's able to reach its own people. The countries that are yellow are somewhat on the border. They're, they're close to 2%, possibly just over, possibly on the brink of being under 2%, but they're considered reached enough, they're a, a critical mass, so they can actually reach their own ethno-linguistic people group as well. The rest of the world is red because those, these are the people whose population contains less than 2% Christian population. This is even Catholics. This is even Orthodox. This is just people who believe in the gospel of Jesus. Maybe they're holding to a different form than we do as Protestants, but they believe that Jesus died, rose from the, from the dead, and that they need to believe in him. All of them, as you can see, are contained within, not all of them, but most of them are contained within that little window that spans from North Africa all the way past where we just sung about, past India there. In fact, you'll notice India and the country that I spoke about a little bit yesterday, which I'm, I'm trying to be sensitive not to mention, it's completely covered in red. You can't see the ground. Even if you zoomed in a little bit, you would not be able to see the ground because there's so much lostness. There are so many lost ethne that need to be reached. It's a startling fact, but nevertheless, we, we have to look at this. We have to feel the weight of this, that there are three billion people that currently do not have access to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So with 3 billion people and over 7,000 people groups, 7,000 red dots that are currently unreached with the gospel, this should inform the way we see what Jesus commands in the Great Commission. You see, unreached peoples and places are those that Jesus is largely unknown. We're not talking about places where Jesus is known, but he's rejected. That's like here, right? In Hickory, there's a lot of people who've heard about Jesus, but maybe they're too bored to go to church. Maybe they don't want to read their Bibles because they don't understand the point. Maybe they don't want to believe in Jesus because they grew up in the church and now they're jaded a little bit. We're not talking about people like that. We're talking about people with literally no access to the gospel. People who might not even know a Christian. Who might not even know to Google the gospel of Jesus Christ on their smartphones. And practically, without outside help, unless something changes unreached peoples, this, the, the red dots that you see, unreached peoples will be born, live their lives, and die without ever hearing the good news about Jesus Christ so as to be saved. They will be born, and try to put yourself in some of these people's shoes. We talk about three billion, that's really hard to conceptualize. Put yourself in one of these shoes. Let's just think of one village kid who is born, who lives his life, and who dies without ever hearing about Jesus, who created him. So now let's return to the Great Commission, and let's see what it actually says. He says, Go therefore and disciple all the nations. Go therefore and disciple all the nations. And once you've done that, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, You'll notice that it does not say, and this is how I've always read it. It doesn't say, go therefore and make, 
as many disciples as you possibly can. That would be awesome, wouldn't it? If, if we could just make as many disciples as we possibly could. That would be great, yes. But what does Jesus command? Is that, is that what's entain, contained in the command? Is that what he entails? It doesn't say, go therefore and make as many disciples as possible. Go therefore and make lots of disciples. That's not what it says. And we know that ultimately making disciples and many of them is how we're going to fulfill the Great Commission. But the command is literally, disciple all the nations. It's not general, make as many disciples as you can. It's very specific. He says, disciple all the nations. So the Great Commission is not a general statement to just make as many disciples as you can. I want to keep saying this. That's a really good thing. To make disciples among Hickory, that's what we want. We want more people worshiping Jesus, and it should bug us that they aren't. But when it comes to this passage, when it comes to the Great Commission, when it comes to Jesus' final words to the apostles and his final marching orders to the church, it is very specific. He says, go and make disciples of all the nations. Every nation, every people is to have a witness. And I'm convinced that if you read the New Testament, you'll get this too. Think of Paul in Romans 15, and, and check me to see if I'm wrong. Last time I preached here, I asked you all to check me to make sure that what I say is biblical. I'm asking you to do the same once again. In Romans 15, I'm convinced that this is what Paul had in mind when he was speaking about his own mission. Just think about his statement in Romans 15, verse 20. He says, And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it's written, and then he quotes Psalm 53, or sorry, Isaiah 53, those who never have been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. This is the reason why I've so been offered, often hindered from coming to you. But now, and, and note these words, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, so let me read that again. It says, but now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I've longed to come many years to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain. What? How could Paul say that there's no longer room to work here? The church just started. He's, they're working on discipling all the nations as we speak. How could he say that he has no room to work here? Asia had millions of people who had never heard the gospel at the time. But what did they have? They had the Corinthians in the Corinthian church. They had the Galatians and the Galatian church. They had the people from Jerusalem sending out people all throughout Asia. What did Spain not have? Spain did not have a church yet. So Paul says, hey, when I get to you, and it's kind of a, a funny way, he's asking for support, but he says, I hope to be helped in passing, you know, to Spain. So he's saying, like, I hope when I get there, you know, I, I need some stuff, so please help me. Um, but he says, I'm going to Spain. There's nothing in Spain. Spain doesn't have a church yet. I'm going there. So I've had a lot of people tell me when I tell them I'm interested in missions as well, and they say, oh, well, Tim, there's so many lost people here. Obviously, that's true. But you know what I always tell them? I say, I know. But they are reached. They say, reached? How can you say that? I say, they have you. They have a church here. This is their access to the gospel. They have you. And you're doing your job, right? You know, it's, it, sometimes it takes a long time for people to get this. It took me two years to explain this to some friends I have about unreached people groups versus just, un, you know, people who are not saved. And they would always tell me the same things. But what I'm talking about is not just lost people. I'm talking about people who have no access to salvation, no access to the gospel. In other words, I'm not talking about lost people in our neighborhood here when I say I want to go reach people unreached people. I'm talking about lost people who don't know they're lost and who no one's trying to find. They're not trying to find the answer and no one's trying to find them. So to reiterate before we move on to what we can do about it, the Great Commission is not just a general statement to make as many disciples as you possibly can, although that's a wonderful thing. The specifics of the command are to disciple every nation, every people, every ethnos. And the problem is, if we keep saying that we're fulfilling the Great Commission and talking about the Great Commission, ultimately, like it's just reaching our neighbors, which 
it is reaching our neighbors, that's part of it, but it's not just reaching our neighbors. If we only talk about it like that, we will rob the church of her goal of making disciples of all the nations. We will downplay what it means to truly be a missionary, someone who gives up everything and goes somewhere foreign to serve the Lord. We will cheapen that and will take away from the church her ultimate marching orders to disciple all the nations. Now, I want to take a minute to demonstrate from Scripture that this is God's desire. Let's take a look at a couple of examples before we move on to what we can do about this problem. We're going to go throughout the entire canon of Scripture and just demonstrate that this is what God has in mind, that this is God's heart when it comes to discipling all the nations. And we're going to see from Genesis to Revelation that this is always what he had in mind. So please do not feel the need to, to keep up with me. I'm going to be rapid fire just reading some of these. But I, w I want you to close your eyes and just think about what is being said in each of these scripture passages. Just hear the emphasis on all the nations and all the peoples and all the families of the earth. So just close your eyes, or if you want to keep your eyes open, if you want to try to keep up, good luck. Genesis 12, 3. I will bless you, Abraham, and those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples, pantata ethne, of the earth will be blessed through you. Exodus 9, 16. But I have raised you, Pharaoh, for this very purpose, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Joshua 4, 24. He did this, God did this, so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful, and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. 1 Kings 8, 43. Then, O Lord, hear from heaven your dwelling place, and do whatever the foreigner asks of you, so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you. 1 Chronicles 16, 24. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all the peoples. Psalm twenty two twenty seven. 27. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. Psalm 33, 8. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. Psalm 67, that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all the nations. Let the peoples be glad. Let them praise you, O Lord. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations on the earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Isaiah 2.2, 2, in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among mountains. It will be raised above the hills and all all the nations will stream to it. Isaiah 49, 6, the Lord says, is it, it, it is too small a thing for you, Jesus, my servant, to restore the tribes of, of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept? I will make you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. Isaiah 52, 10, the Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. Isaiah 66, 18. And I, because of their actions and their imaginations, am about to come and gather all the nations and tongues, and they will come and see my glory. Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. Luke 24, verse 47, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all the nations, beginning in Jerusalem. Revelation 5, 9, and they sang a new song, saying, you are worthy to take the scroll, Jesus, and open its seals, because you were slain, and by your blood you bought, you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. In Revelation 7, 9 through 12, after this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, and who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they all fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Behold, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. 
Amen. So do you think that the Bible supports my hypothesis? That what Jesus commands to the church is not just a general command to make lots of followers of Jesus, but specifically to disciple all the nations. So what do we do about this? What, what are we supposed, how could we possibly contribute to such a task? How can we fulfill the Great Commission as a church, as a Christian? Well, first, and I want to encourage you with this. First, just realize that the church at large is unaware of what I'm saying. The church at large is unaware of what I'm sharing with you, and I want you to commit to spreading this knowledge. I want you to commit to actually sharing with other people, other churches, pastors. If you're a pastor of another church in here, think about how your missions program, how your sermons, how your songs, how how all this can fit towards that end of all the peoples coming and being gathered before the Lord. That's the first part is just knowing. And sadly, most American Christians do not understand God's heart for the, for the nations throughout the whole Bible. They don't understand that what Jesus was commanding was very specific to disciple all the nations. And with this in view, with God's heart for every people, this should inform three things at least. At least. The way we go, the way we give, and the way we pray. Let's touch on each of those three just for a minute. The way we go. Let me, do a, let me ask you to do a mental exercise. In your mind, draw a circle. So we've got a pie, right? We've got a pumpkin pie, make it an apple pie if you like, it's fall. We've got a circle, we've got a pie. Now split it into thirds, three big pieces of the pie. This represents the world. The first third are those who are reached with the gospel and have access. Yeah, these, these are believers, at least in name. So the first third of the world are believers, They believe in the gospel, or at least they say they do. Now, the second third, which is just under three billion people, are those who are not Christians. They don't say that they believe the gospel, but at least they know about it. At least they have access. Maybe they have a Christian neighbor. Maybe the guy who sells vegetables in their city is a Christian. They have access to the gospel. I want you to think about maybe Europe or or South America, where there has been some influence of the gospel uh, through the last centuries. And now the final group, the final third of the pie, these three billion people, these are not Christians, and they have no access to the gospel. These are those who, if you asked them about Jesus, if you said, do you know about Jesus? They would say, "Uh, who's Jesus? Or they'd say, yeah, Isa, he's in the Quran. But they wouldn't specifically know who you're talking about. Now, I want you to guess where the majority of our missionaries go out from, or where they go out to, from the North American church. Obviously not the first third, right? We don't usually send missionaries to Christians. The second third or the third third? Out of 36 missionaries that go to foreign fields, who travel overseas to preach the gospel, studies show recently that only two out of those 36 missionaries go to the last category of unreached and unengaged peoples. Out of 36 missionaries that are being sent out from North American churches, 34 of them will go to people who already have heard about Jesus, but have rejected him. And only two of them will go to those people who have no access to the gospel and don't know about Jesus. This is the great imbalance of our day, missiologically speaking. And I want to implore you as a church, gateway, listen, and individuals who consider sending and supporting missions, we need to start majoring on those who are most unreached. And if you're planning to be a goer, if the Lord stirs up your heart and you want to go somewhere, consider, I want to ask you, I want to implore with you, consider going to one of the places where Jesus is not known and where the gospel has not gone yet, where people don't have access. We need to change the way we go. That's the first thing. The second thing, the way we give. Do you realize churches are spending approximately 99% of our missions resources in places that are already reached with the gospel? 99%? To put this another way, churches are spending less than 1% of our missions resources among the 3 billion people in 7,000 ethne people groups who haven't yet heard the gospel. In fact, a study showed back in 2011, that more money is spent each year in America 
on costumes for pets on Halloween than the amount of money that's given to missions among unreached people groups? Why is this? Why is this? This doesn't se- does this not seem imbalanced to you if we know the heart of God, if we know the mission, if we know the ultimate end from Revelation for this to be the case in the American church? Well, part of the problem is we often view it in terms of return on investment. If I give $2,000 a year to this mission field, I know there's going to be lots of converts. So I'm going to keep giving to this mission field because that will make lots of disciples, right? But if I give $2,000 to missions in Morocco, I'm really not going to see much return on investment. If I make wells in somewhere like Pakistan or Bangladesh, I'm really not going to see a lot of return on my investment. So I'm going to go give where there's going to be lots of fruit. That's the attitude. But do you realize that Mi- William Carey, William Carey, the, the father of modern missions, he actually took seven years before he saw a single convert from his ministry. He went to pagan India and preached the gospel faithfully for seven years before he saw anybody come to Christ. And now, because he held on to the reins of the bull, there are many Christians in India. There are many churches, there are many translations of the Bible even that have resulted from faithful William Carey not giving up, even though he was told not to go because he wouldn't see any fruit. We need to think in terms of long run and not just short term, because now there are millions and millions of people who've been touched by William Carey. We have to be willing to support groundbreaking work rather than just fruit picking work. You have to see you're giving in terms of breaking ground and, and actually tilling the soil for the gospel to be planted. And we got to stop thinking about just where converts can be made. Something else. There's one family I know. When, when we talk about giving, a lot of times we have it in terms of what other people give. And, oh, 10% is the tithe amount in Leviticus, and I can give this much. I know a family who gives 51% of their income straight to missionaries that they support to unreached people groups. And it's not because they're rich. He's, the man is an engineer, the mom stays at home and and schools the kids, but they thought that God was telling them to live off of less than they gave towards unreached people groups. So they decided to just budget and live with 49% of their income. There was a girl that I knew who just graduated from college, got a really good engineering job, and she was shown by some, some other missionaries that she could live on just like 10% of her income that the fixed amounts on her budget were really just 10%. And so she started giving as much as she could to this kind of work being done. And let me, let me just say, my aim is not to rebuke or to convict, because I don't give that to missions. My aim is not to rebuke or convict, but to encourage. We need to start thinking about what we could do instead of what we, sh- what we have to do. Just in terms of obligatory, you know, I've got to get my 10%, and then I've got to find some missionaries to support Let's think about it the way God thinks about it. Let's give generously, radically, but with a cheerful heart. Because it's going to take a lot of giving before we see all the nations discipled. The final thing, and this may seem small to you, but I encourage you, please don't think about it this way. We need to pray. We need to pray. We often downplay this, but do you know how the omnipotent God, who, who ordains all things and has all things in his hand, has actually decided that his mission was going to be accomplished through prayer. Through prayer. God delights in the prayers of his saints, and he wants us to partner with him and ask him for the work to be done so that he'll do it. This is the modus operandi of missions. This is the normal way that it's done. When Jesus gave his instructions to the disciples in Matthew chapter 9 and in Luke chapter 10, what does he tell them to do? He says, the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few, Therefore, get a lot of people and try to go. Is that what he says? No, he says the the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. Therefore, ask, earnestly ask that the Lord of the harvest will send out laborers into his harvest. And notice he says it's his harvest. This isn't like God is going to some new field as well. This is it's his world. The, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He rules all the nations already. And we just got to go and, and pick that fruit because it's his vineyard. So when Jesus gives his instructions, he tells them, there's a big problem. You need to pray. We often think, what is five minutes in our prayer closet going to do? What is five minutes just saying, Lord, please send laborers into Bangladesh, send laborers into Pakistan. 
What, what is that going to do, right? We, I often think like that. We think that we spurn the ordinary means of grace and we say, that's not going to do much. But it does everything. That's how God has reached us with the gospel in America, through the prayers of Europeans finally coming over and taking the gospel here. I mean, every time that we see a missions movement started, it's backed by prayer. Mil- William Carey, a couple years before that, there was a little prayer meeting that people would be sent to India, and that's why William Carey went. Not because William Carey was just that cool of a guy. Once again, the, the modus operandi of missions is prayer. And Samuel Zwamer, my favorite, famously wrote, the history of missions is a history of answered prayer. So let me ask you, with my company, we're actually doing something every, every day at 9.38, 9.38 a.m. or p.m. If you're a night owl, p.m. If you're a morning person, a.m., Set your alarm or set a reminder to pray that the Lord of the harvest will send out laborers into his harvest. Set your alarms for 938, because Matthew 938 is that verse. It's an easy way to remember. And tell other Christians, set your alarm every day. Pray to God. Just throw up a little prayer and say, please God, send out laborers into your harvest. I'm really bothered by people not obeying the gospel, by people not being saved. Send out laborers in your harvest. I want to see that changed. Just pray, saint. Pray that God will do that. So once again, 938, set your alarms. And you'll notice in all of these applications as we come to a close, all of these applications require quite a bit of sacrifice. But let me ask, and think with me, can it really be called sacrifice if Christ is truly worth it? What is a sacrifice? A sacrifice is something that you give up that you expect nothing in return from. You just lay it down and you, you don't expect to receive anything, it, that's why it's called a sacrifice, because it's a loss. But if it's something that you offer with expectation of reciprocity, it's actually an investment. If you expect to receive something back for what you sacrifice, it can't be called a sacrifice. It's called an investment. We do this with the stock market. And if Jesus is really worth it, these are not sacrifices. These are investments. And investments hurt at first, but they yield long-term yields, benefits. Think about what Peter is told when he thinks that he's making this great sacrifice by following Jesus. Peter assumes that he's leaving everything and following Jesus, making this huge sacrifice. What does God tell him? Jesus says, Peter, well first Peter says, see we've left everything and followed you Jesus. See look look at what we've done. Jesus says, truly I say to you, there's no one who's left house or brothers, or sisters, or mother, or father, or children, or lands, for my sake and the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold. Now in this time, houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, lands, with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. Peter Peter tells Jesus, look at all this that we're sacrificing, and Jesus says, just quit your blabbing. You're not sacrificing anything. You're going to get all that back. You're going to get way more than that. These are not sacrifices. These are investments. And now let me tell you a story to close. And you tell me, was this a wise or a foolish investment that these two men made? In 1972, sorry, in 1732, very different. In 1732, two young Moravians, John Leonard Dober and David Nietzscheman, heard of an island in the West Indies where an atheist British owner had about 2,000 to 3,000 slaves that he would buy and bring to this island for work. The owner said, no preacher, no clergyman will ever stay on this island. If he's shipwrecked, we'll keep him in a separate house until he has to leave, but he's never going to talk to any of us about God. And I am through with that nonsense. So 3,000 slaves from the jungles of Africa were brought to this island in the Atlantic where they were to live and die without ever hearing about Christ. They were without access. Several thousand black slaves doomed to toil under the sun in sugar canes and to have no access to the gospel in their life and death. So two young Germans, the aforementioned young men, in their 20s, about my age, in their 20s from the Moravian sect heard about the plight of these people on this island and they were willing to sell themselves to the British planter for a standard price for a male slave. The Moravian community from Herrenhut came to see these two lads off who would never return again, having freely sold themselves into a lifetime of slavery. As a member of the slave community, they would witness as Christians to the love of God to these 3,000 slaves. Finally, family members were emotional, weeping. They were standing on the dock 
was their extreme sacrifice wise? Was it necessary? The housings had been cast off and they were hurled upon the pier. And as the ship slipped away into the tide and the gap between them and the dock with their families widened, the two men linked their arms, raised their hands, and shouted across the spreading gap, May the lamb who was slain receive the reward of his suffering. Was this a wise or a foolish investment that these two men made? Well, if we could only see, if we could only have a mind that truly grasps the reality of eternity, of heaven, of hell, of the glory of God, the shortness of life, the rewards of heaven, the horrors of hell, then we would rise to the task which the Lord commissioned us 2,000 years ago. Let us, as a church of the sovereign Lord, disciple all the nations. And let's pray to that end. God, we come before you. Lord, we ask you that you would indeed send out laborers into your harvest, that you would take that three billion people, the 7,000 unreached people groups, and that you would change that, Lord. It bugs us. We're not content, O oh God, with the church being the way that it is. We want to see disciples made of every nation, and we want to be part of that. Would you use us? Would you raise up people from this place? Would you tug on the hearts of people as I'm praying that they should be involved in this work, that they should pray, that they should give, that they should consider going? Lord, let them not count their lives as worth anything, only that they may fulfill the ministry that you've called them to. And so we ask this, Lord, that you might be glorified, that Jesus might be exalted in his name. Amen. Many things flashing through my mind as I listen to you, but one there as you close is that I had the privilege of growing up in the Moravian Church in Winston-Salem. And believe it or not, through our catechism and other things, remember hearing that they were actually the first to send missionaries to the Virgin Islands there long before many others began to mobilize. And it was also the Moravians that uh, had a great impact on John Wesley who obviously God used in marvelous ways. And, but even before uh, there were the Moravians, there was one who was a forerunner of the Moravians, that a gentleman by the name of Jan Hus, who was burned at the stake for the sake of the gospel when the Catholic Church asked him to recant the authority of Scripture over the authority of the church. Now, just in a very uh, concise, quite honestly, when you think of going around the world and what our mission folks have laid out and framed for us, and what we've heard over the course of the last two days has been truly remarkable because what we've heard is the saving power of what? Of the gospel, that it's made its way to places reaching folks in Japan and in Zambia and in Cuba and uh, the, those who come and follow after the Aztecs there in Mexico. And we've heard of others up there in New Jersey. And, and now as we think of this great conference, which was established by Germans who found themselves underneath the sovereign orchestration of God being bound there while World War II was unfolding. And so here we are in this place called Morganton, North Carolina. And we've got a few folks from Hickory and some other places as well. But what we've been reminded of in a remarkable way is God's heart for the nations, and no matter where we are on this, on this earth, as followers of Christ Jesus, we are joined with Christ, we are joined with the body of Christ, and so consequently, we are joined with what? The commission, the privilege, the call to help carry and advance the gospel of Jesus Christ so that their disciples, whether they're many or few, in all the ethne, the nations, the people groups of the world. So we cannot be passive. We cannot be reluctant. We, we cannot be soft. We must be vigorous in joining what we have heard over the last two days to team with these precious folks and what they have modeled for us. Even as I think of, yes, Chris, you guys, now for more than two decades pursuing, persisting to see that monastery used to advance the gospel that reaches back even to the Spanish Reformation. 
to, to, to hear of, of you folks and even your heart yesterday in the panel discussion as Hannah shared about the reality of, of excitement to join with her husband but to grieve as she steps away. And so there's, there is cost and yet it is an investment. It means that while we have these few days on this earth, it will quickly fly away. And I don't know about you, but I've been reminded of the frailty of this life. So what will not just we, in a, in a kind of a way that we can step or be distant from, but what will you, what will you, and then us collectively together, give ourselves to as we go forth, having heard all that we're accountable. We're accountable for the remarkable testimonies and the challenge that we have heard. And Lord willing here momentarily, and yes, he's here, we have a great tribute and one who models what we're celebrating here. But I would be remiss if I just didn't uh, give you as God's people a simple, not only word of challenge, but opportunity. If what we have heard over the course of these last two days, if, if, if we embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ and the words that have been shared with us, if, if we realize that the harvest is great, but surely God needs to raise up more in the way of laborers, then, then I want to ask you, whether it is in, in going or giving or praying, if it is your heart intent, your ambition to be engaged and to be a part of that, I'm going to ask you to stand right where you are to be a part of this commission, to give, to pray, and if God so would lead, to go. To stand on your feet. Otherwise, you're just here for a nice lunch, which I hope you enjoy, but I hope it convicts the dog out of you. Now, I'm going to ask you to sit down, and I have one more, one more offering. And I just, I'm just going to ask it, and I'll, I'll be brief because I don't believe in twisting arms. But if you've heard something over the course of this weekend that's spoken specifically to you, and you sense the Lord stirring you to gospel ministry, perhaps even going uh, far and wide for the sake of the gospel, I'm going to invite you to stand. Anybody stirred within that wants to join with carrying the gospel to the nations and perhaps even leaving this soil and going far. If, if you are, then I just want to give you a chance to stand and make that, make that declaration. You're open to God leading you to go far. Anyone? Okay, Aelani. Doesn't surprise me at all. At all. You know, God does great things with small amounts, doesn't he? Just takes a mustard seed. Anyone else? Okay. I guess your baby is committed. That was one of the things that struck me quite honestly yesterday. You can sit down. Was, Hannah, you said you... you you didn't want to be, in, uh, be a part of missions. You didn't want to marry a redhead. You sure didn't want to go to Asia. <laughs> and the Lord was laughing in heaven, saying, yeah, right, sister. Oh. And here you are married to a wonderful redhead, taking your two precious children, teaming up together. But you had to wrestle with that, and I appreciate your transparency with that. You guys are starting out, and we're so excited as you burst out of the gate and we're going to be cheering for you and tracking with you and all of that as we are all the other missionaries but what a great way for us this morning to have opportunity uh, and I'm going to ask Zach if you uh, bring your dad down and come on right over here we have just been making our way through what first Thessalonians and then second Thessalonians and in that 
What did we learn early on? That Paul was just there a matter of weeks, and then he was, he was rushed away with their team. And yet, when he writes, when he writes back to those folks, even as a young church, remember what he says early on? He references the fact that they are examples that already God is using to advance the gospel. We're in Achaia and in Macedonia. And we have, this morning, a dear and precious soul who had been an example to us as a body of believers from the very beginning. The very beginning. The, in fact, you were there in the birth canal. Right? You didn't know, know that you were, what do they call them? Okay. You were there. Remember that? You, you, were, you were the, uh, not the birth mom, but you were helping out there as, as our church was birthed with those five couples 21 years ago. Yeah. Well, you're, we're all in there somewhere for sure. Yeah. But we are delighted to have you here this morning for our first missions conference. And we have some dear folks, uh, Todd and Ruth Arnsman, who are going to come. If y'all want to come on up and share uh, a tribute. And then we want to give you a chance to, to share anything that's on your heart. And then I'm going to ask some of those core guys to come, and we're going to pray uh, and give thanks over you as well. Dwight Stone is a missionary whose ministry has not only been foundational in European Christian mission, Romania, but also in the very beginnings of Gateway Bible Church, with whom you're worshiping today. <clears throat> the story of his life is redemptive, like the stories of each one of us who has been rescued from our sins. Dwight has offered that if the story of his life can change, encourage you in the Lord this morning, he is happy for it to be shared for the glory of God and for your edification. So here's a brief narrative of the life of a man whom God has used in many ways in his kingdom on the earth. In 1941, just outside of New York City, Dwight Stone's story began. As the oldest of four children, he grew up like many other young boys his age, happy and enjoying life. But something was terribly wrong on the inside where love and warmth should have flourished, there was an emptiness fueled by a lack of relationship with his father. At the age of five, Dwight met his dad for the first time as he returned from World War II. He was distant and just didn't have the ability to be a hands-on father. Dwight felt that the war had taken some things out of him. This void caused a deep disturbance in Dwight that went forward with him into adulthood. As he grew, rebellion permeated his life, creating deep ruts of anger, substance abuse. By the time he graduated from high school, the severity of his addictions had barred his entry to college. The military, however, saw his potential, and Dwight enlisted and was assigned to the U.S. military wrestling team in Europe for the next two years. At the age of 20, Dwight left his successful military career, moving ahead with a life more intoxicated by his addictions. He gained a job working for a financial institution on Wall Street. His ruthless style and tenacity allowed him to rise in the ranks to become one of the most successful stockbrokers in New York City. However, at the age of 34, Dwight had an encounter that would change his life. A client with a background similar to his own told Dwight about his former, former life of drug and alcohol addiction and how six months prior, Jesus had changed his life. A year later, Dwight experienced the missing relationship he had longed for all his life. He learned what it was to be loved by a father, his heavenly father. As Dwight grew in his relationship with God, everything began to change in his life and that of his family. They joined a church. 
hungry for the truth they had missed all their lives. The anger was replaced by love. The addictions exchanged for satisfying joy in knowing Christ. One year later, God spoke to Dwight through Psalm 37, 3 through 5. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land. Cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he will do it. Dwight recounted, All of a sudden, I knew I could no longer be interested in telling people how to make money. I had to tell them how to find Christ. Shortly after this revelation, he was asked by his church to become the pastor of a church plant that was moving to Rutherfordton, North Carolina. He had no pastoral training, only a high school degree and a heart of faith. So for the next five and a half years, Dwight was the faithful pastor of Grace Bible Church. During his time there, he was connected with a man named Steve Abels, brother to our Don Abels and pastor of Hickory Community Chapel the church that planted this church and is now called Hickory Bible Church. Steve and Dwight became great friends, and the chapel asked Dwight to head up an outreach to the poor and needy. He stepped out in faith again, moving his family to Hickory and being used of the Lord to begin this ministry, as well as starting several jail ministries, finding connection with the inmates through sharing his past struggle with alcohol. Twelve years later... In 1997, my family would move to Burke County and attend Hickory Community Chapel with our three children. We got there in time to meet Dwight, his beautiful wife, Andrea, and their son, Zach, just as they were being commissioned by the church to go to Poland, where they would work with and disciple young believers. We were struck by their obedience to Christ, their love for him, and their humility. A year into their ministry, they had to return home as Andrea was battling cancer. The plane flight back to the States was difficult as Dwight and Zach held her between them, trying to keep her warm and comforted. At home in Hickory, Dwight cared for her, bathing, feeding, encouraging her. Andrea passed away in the spring of 2000. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his godly ones. Psalm 116:15. At that very time, because God is always working all of the time, the elders of the chapel encouraged our family, the birds, the garrisons, and the Eskridges to help plant a church in our community here in Burke County. The chapel gave sacrificially of their leadership, oversight, worship leaders, and all manner of support. And they suggested that Dwight Stone come alongside us as a mentor and teacher for our small congregation so six months after his wife's passing, Dwight began to make the weekly trip to Valdez, where we met in homes, preaching to us a message out of Revelation 3, to be like the church in Philadelphia, having a little power, but following the word of the Lord and not denying his name. As the small group gathered around him every week, he made sure we were clear that it was Christ himself that was building his church. That message has been a sustaining one throughout our church presence. We eventually asked him to consider becoming our pastor. However, Romania was already on the horizon. With a request for him to come and, a, and pastor a church in Bucharest, he followed the Lord's leading. There was trouble initially upon his arrival there. The man who had contacted him to come to Romania had deceived him stealing his car and generally persecuting him for several months. Dwight survived through the efforts of a few college students who gave him protection. His faith was tested in this, but God began to unfold his ministry. Someone asked him to help a family living outside the city. He went, and what he saw changed his life forever. A one-room shack with large holes in the walls, excrement covering the ground, and a family living there, clothed in rags. Gypsies of the Roma ethnicity, an infamous people group across Romania, known for pickpocketing and thievery. They were regarded by the Romanians as garbage, yet it was these people who gave Dwight a reason to stay. He knew what it felt like to be unwanted, and he knew the joy of being accepted into God's family. 
Dwight and a handful of Romanians began preaching in the gypsy streets. Dwight recalls, I remember times when it would be snowing out and the snow would be on my Bible so that I couldn't see the words, but the people would stay because they had not heard the good news yet. These were the beginnings of ECM Romania and how the Lord used a former New York Stock Exchange broker to minister to a forgotten people on the outskirts of Bucharest, Romania. Twenty years later, the Lord has opened more doors for the gospel to the gypsies in the smaller towns and villages to the southeast of Bucharest, and through ECM has provided a staff of Romanian nationals who minister in these areas as well as a gypsy pastor, George Botofei, who faithfully pastors the Philadelphia Baptist Church in Budeshti. The impact of Dwight's obedience to stay in the midst of persecution and share the good news with a rejected people are far-reaching. Although Dwight is currently unable to travel back to Romania due to physical difficulties, he continues to do battle in prayer. He told me that his faith is being tested in his afflictions, but he continues to stand on God's word, referencing 2 Corinthians 12.9. My grace is sufficient for you. He continues to trust the Lord and live faithfully before him. We are thankful for this brother, mentor, and friend, and for the beautiful way the Lord has used his life. Todd here? Okay. <sighs> Dwight, this is this is a token of our love and affection for you. Zach, I want you and, and, and Dwight to come down too. These are his sons. Yeah. Sons Dwight and Zach. And my grandson is there. Okay. My grandson. Okay. Christian. And I'm going to ask uh, Carrie and Clint to uh, lay hands on you. And we just want to pray over you a prayer of thanksgiving for your faithfulness to the Lord Jesus and to his calling. Or how they could... Uh, come and, and and be involved in the work that he has been doing in Romania for all these years, and then the the people in Romania, the youth and the young people that he invested so much time and energy and love into. Thank you for placing uh, those desires in in his heart to to reach out to. Um, to make your name known and loved. Father, I, when I think of Dwight, I think of your sovereignty and just how you have, um, just, just listening to his story today, just how you have, uh, in ways that only you could do, brought him to yourself and then used that, that love that he has for you to, to love others. So we thank you for that. Um, Today's like a building in Ebenezer, Lord, just each of those stones in, in memory of, of your faithfulness in, in Dwight's life. And so we're thankful. And as, as Carrie prayed, just continue to sustain him and to, um, in new ways, make yourself known to him so that he can continue to enjoy you. Um, Father, help us as a body to, to love Dwight as well and to um, encourage him as he has encouraged us over the years. Lord, there are just times, moments, uh, where uh, gratitude just uh, overflows. 
just overflows. And this is one of those moments because as you have joined us to yourself, you've joined us to one another. And uh, our specific thanks even here this morning is uh, for your servant Dwight, even as you showed us a few weeks ago with Moses and with Joshua, they were described as servants of the Lord. There was no greater, great, greater title or description. And that's what Dwight has modeled for us. I've seen it when he's been here with us. I've seen it when we were in Romania. I've seen it in Armenia. And, and just the reports of his faithfulness to go and to love people in Jesus' name. So even now, there are brothers and sisters all throughout Eastern Europe and in other places that know you and love you, Lord, and are worshiping you and living for you and carrying your gospel. We think of those jispies there in Budesht and those other communities, and we pray, God, that you would continue to, to pour out a mighty work. You choose to use the simple, humble things of this world uh, to confound the wise, but also, Lord, to, to do great and glorious things. So, Lord... Uh, we lift up Dwight to you. We thank you for his, his uh, children and his grandchildren. And we pray your blessing on them as well, even to have them here with us this morning. And that you continue to undergird and strengthen our brother as he runs towards the finish line. Looking forward to seeing you face to face. Yes, Jesus, we thank you. And pray these prayers in your precious name. Amen. Give that to you guys. That's for, for your dad. Am I supposed to say something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I just want to say, I just want to tell you that uh, I've loved this congregation right from the beginning. Very special in my heart. I prayed for you every day, no matter where I was, whether I was in Russia or Armenia or wherever. And um, just just care for one another and love for one another because that's what, it, what the bottom line is, is God wants to know, do you love me? And do you love my brothers and sisters? That's what he wants to know. That's what he's looking for. Um, just one last word. Uh, my sheep hear my voice. I know them. And what do they do? We follow him. Follow him. That's my word. Praise be to God. Peter Rumswinkel and I were talking before church about some of the uh, men who have made an impact in our lives, Dwight being one of them. There were times over the last uh, years here recently that just um, thinking of Dwight kept you going because we knew his, his uh, battles with the realities of aging and, and yet he continued to press on. Um, I even wondered if I might need some wrestling moves, but, uh, so when you think of a song to end on, uh, thinking of Dwight, thinking of all the missionaries and all that they've shared, I know that Dwight would say that all that's been done was not through him, but through Christ being in him. Stand with us as we close. Rise. 
Thank you for uh, joining with us over these last two days, and we look forward to a great lunch and some more time of fellowship. Hopefully you did get one of these uh, bookmarks that has all of the mission folks that we're teaming up with, and it's a great way to tuck it into your Bible to be prompted to pray. Ruth, absolutely beautiful. Absolutely, yeah, beautiful. Well, let's be encouraged by these words at the end of Hebrews. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with every good thing, that you may be able to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. All right. I think the, you make your way around out there in the hall and the food's over on that side. So look forward to a great meal together. Amen.